Zimbabwe media capture has been an issue. There are concerns across the divide that journalists and media houses have been captured to do the bidding of either politicians, corporate players, or individuals who are out for revenge and blood. The term khaki or brown envelopes have been making the rounds. There are some people who believe that the media in Zimbabwe has lost its teeth and cannot be trusted anymore. Now, we look into this issue this week to see the state of the media, whether the media is captured or whether the media can be trusted. I'll be joined in studio later on by Dumisani Mulea and, and Susan Makore. Dumisani Mulea is an award-winning journalist, an investigative journalist who has uh, rose through the ranks the Zimbabwe Independent and became the Zimbabwe Independent editor. Now he's leading an investigative hub or investigative newsroom called the Newsworks. He's also the uh, chairperson of the Zimbabwe National Editors Forum, ZINEF. We're also going to have conversations with uh, Susan Makore. She's a former CEO of a broadcasting uh, company and now the Zimbabwe Media Commission. Uh, commissioner. She's also um, a member of the of WINF, Women in News Network, and she will be talking about her perspectives and understanding of the media. But before we have this conversation, we go to the streets, we talk to the people, we ask them just one question, just one question. Do they trust the media? And the me does the media make sense to them anymore? Ni trust a ni kudako kuti zimwe nyaya zinota orwa kana zati no virenga manau mapeva nau tenge tambo zona ziti ka life. Ya tuno trust a saka nyanya chayus. Eh che kuti anga zati no trust ra media dunde che kuti eh pona saka wanda zati singa singa ni na zo zati singa ono ono mazi zo zuni tika wone jimbo zirekure. Saka zo zomu ni zingongo wa mati viti no kwanza kujuona. partly I trust the media. You know what? The media is necessary. Every story I want to pass on social media and everything. You know, gonna go not not hundred percent true and it could be fifty percent or even ten percent. There's no smoke that fire. That's one thing I, I know. Saga, the media is necessary. 
only that that's what I say. Yeah, me dear Munum Zababo did trust a boss in a Brisa Zagawanda, Jess, and only a monomonica, Messe Munum. Nobody about media, so I told you trust us in gate. It was so true to it, told Papa Mediasus. So I told you trust us in gate. Ah, media, Master, and I could need some man in Ugdi, some when you had the Ungo Buddha. Eh, this was what you can get a good pitch, Pirak, the Mununs, what could you put, the Michoka, the so. Ah, Masana, so I could need a good trust of this, which you got in the cheap. No, I'm going to go to Rania, I'm going to Ropa, me, the Papa, no, 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 was media one media gana kera kuti ino kuvura brain ino teacher saka nini media ango wa number one boz pano zingo zoko sanga kwa nso kona pa radio zoko zoko sanga kwa nso kona pa tv aso ka user media ino kwa nso kupa umbo ino kwa nso kupa mwema fix e pa mpacho ino nyepa pa mpacho ino laji chukwati saka nini media ando ni trust pa kuti ili advance nge ino batira nge ino ino kuvura brain sa media media ili bo no, of course, no. I media. Yes, of course. I know this media. But I guess no. Just in terms of media, match or who enjoy, who go for it. But when we go for it, we show. You know, as we go for it, we media. You know, you know, media, media, everybody. So the media, 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 is brought to you in proud partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation. I'm sure you've listened to the views of the people and what they think about the media. Now we get into speaking. Our first segment is going to be with Dumisan Mulea. Good afternoon to our viewers and welcome to this edition of Free Talk. This program brought to you in partnership with the Frederick Newman Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. And I am your host, Dara Blessed Mklang. Now, we are joined in studio this evening uh, by one of the most prolific journalists in Zimbabwe, an investigative uh, journalist, award-winning investigative journalist, if I should say, um, a long-time uh, journalist with the Zimbabwe Independent, where he actually became the editor, and now he's leading the investigative arm of News Hawks. This is none other than Dumisani, Dumisani Mulea. Now, Dumisani Mulea will take us through as we discuss the issue of brown envelopes, the state of the media in Zimbabwe, the media capture, and what it means to the development and movement of Zimbabwe. Now, thank you, Dumisani, and welcome to Heart, to Heart and Soul TV and Radio. Thank you so much, Blessed. Yeah. Thanks uh, to your listeners and viewers. Sure. Can you just take us through, in your opening remarks, the state of the media in Zimbabwe at the present moment? Well, um, starting with the really uh, positive, progressive side of things, the media is expanding in Zimbabwe. Um, Apart from the conventional um, uh, big media organizations, the Zim Papers, your AMH, your ANZs, we are seeing new startups, particularly digital media, is opening up the space, providing uh, alternative platforms to write stories, to air views. And uh, the digital space itself is uh, also helping that. Heart and Soul itself is evidence of that. It's a, a space that is growing, that is expanding. So that means that uh, the media space is, uh, is uh, currently opening up, it's currently growing. In the meanwhile, in the uh, reform front, there have been some few incremental reforms. Um, the ZMC, for instance, the Zimbabwe Media Commission, um, it has reformed in many ways internally. It no longer refuses to um, register media organizations, refuse to accredit journalists. It used to, it used to refuse to accredit journalists until it's taken to court and so on. Those things, they seem to be things of the past in that area. And then, um, uh, broadly speaking, the issue of reform itself 
is now being accepted as a, an imperative that needs to be done. In the past, the government never wanted to hear the word reform in relation to the media. And of course, I mean, other areas of uh, um, society, politics, uh, economy, and even socially. But now, the idea of reform is embraced. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, new um, uh, uh, laws that are coming on stream to deal with the media. We've removed IPA. There's freedom of information coming, the media practitioners bill coming. Of course, the devil lies in the detail what those laws contain or will contain. Um, but there are some changes that are happening in the media space. And uh, we are also discussing right now, um, as the Editors Forum, Zimbabwe National Editors Forum, which I chair, we've met uh, the Zimbabwe Media Commission to discuss the issue of accreditation in relation to who is a journalist, who is not a journalist. The reason why that is being discussed is that uh, these days, you guys are professional doing professional job. But uh, everyone with a camera there, I mean a phone camera, a phone, they can take pictures, they can take videos. So that brings the question, should we call them journalists? What should they be called? Citizen journalists or citizens who are enjoying their freedom of expression? Because if they do that, if I am a guy who is basically doing farming elsewhere, but I'm in the business of taking some videos and uh, running them either on YouTube or uh, social media, can I go to ZMC and say I need accreditation to do much more extra work? So those are some of the things we are discussing. But basically the point I'm making is that there have been these uh, changes in the media which are progressive. However, there is the other side of the same story. The other side is that um, journalism remains criminalized in this country. It remains criminalized because the establishment, the political establishment, or the government to be specific, is still struggling to come to terms with the free media, a media that uh, reports in a much more free, in a fair, in a balanced way. They're struggling to come to terms with that, particularly in the um, uh, advent of digital media, which offers many opportunities for people to, to write, including on uh, digital media. So that is why we still see justifications uh, of arrest of journalists like Robert Chimono. They will come up with an explanation, say he's an activist, this and that. But that's a justification for wrongdoing. The guy is a journalist, he's publishing where he publishes on social media, and uh, when he publishes things, don't call me an activist because you do not like the way he is coming across. Journal journalism is very strands. There is journalism which is mere reportage, there is journalism which is investigative, there is journalism which is uh, uh, activism based. You can be a, a journalist uh, but advocate for certain causes for environment, protection of the environment, for climate change, you can advocate for women's rights, uh, you can be a journalist fighting corruption. So we need not criminalize that. Uh, this is where we're still struggling. And of course we're still struggling in, uh, to come up with a very uh, thoroughgoing, deep fundamental reform, especially on broadcasting. We've seen government saying that it's opening up the space, but what it has done is give licenses to the same voice. In other words, there's an advancement of pluralism without diversity. We need both. We need pluralism and diversity at the same time because they complement each other. There's no point in having many voices that are the same, but there's everything to be benefited by having many voices which are different. Then it becomes truly a marketplace of ideas, debate, quality ideas emerge in that environment. That's what we are, we are, we are still struggling overall. And then of course, added to that, um, there is the issue of media capture. Media capture by definition is um, certain forces at play trying to come and interfere with media organizations, their mandate, which is serving the public interest, and they are on editorial policies and veering them, of course, to do certain things that those media organizations by themselves did not set to do. Let me give you an example. Uh, public media is there to serve the public interest. 
is not owned by anyone. ZBC is there to serve you and me. It's a public broadcaster. Zim Peppers is a public media organization. But their interest that gets them there, grab them, seize them, to do their bidding, that's capture. Because it has now been taken away from what it is supposed to do. It has been captured by certain interests to further their agenda, their own interest. Similarly, when it comes to private media, if a private media organization is there uh, to report truthfully, fairly, without fear and favor uh, against everybody and everybody, whether people and everyone, whether people in the public sector, private sector, and all these other interest groups, civil society and so on, if it is to be found that it is no longer doing that because of the outside interference, it is no longer uh, reporting fairly and uh, truthfully, credibly, it is no longer fulfilling its own promise to its readers and audiences because there's been interference in its electoral policy, interference in its ownership structures, interference in um, its commercial activities, then that is captured. Mm. That's captured because you have been seized away from the mandate, the mandate of public interest that your values, your true policy, your statements, your own statements, publicly committing to those values and principles, it has been hijacked. Mm -hmm. When it's hijacked, that's captured. In, in your view, do, do we have a free, independent media in Zimbabwe? Is it, or because people have said uh, countless numbers that you and your kin have been captured. Yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, the, the, the free independent media exists, but there's been a lot of interference in it. It has been a, a good space growing, but if you look at the media organizations that are in the space of uh, private media, which is supposed to be free and independent, there's been quite a lot of interference from political perspective. Politicians wanting to interfere to hijack the electoral policies of those organizations in the private media. There's been a lot of overbearing influence on them by commercial interests. There is also a lot of pressure on them through legislative means. For instance, if you um, want a license, and then you are told that a broadcasting license or TV license, you are told that the only way you can get it is if you um, shift your editorial policy to align with your interest. Mm. That is a process of capture. Mm. But so, can, can the so members of much interference. Mm, can the members of the public, uh, Dumi, trust you? Uh, when I say you, I mean the the media yes. the spectrum. In, in, can they trust you? Can can they wake up and say, um, I'm tuning into this radio station, or I'm buying this newspaper, and I'm going to get credible, uh, uncaptured information? Yes, there's still a lot of hope in that space because remember. Uh, for every action there is also an opposing force, yeah. The thing is, there are forces that are acting upon these media organizations and their troll policies. But you also have journalists in the newsrooms uh, whose interests are not commercial, they're not political, they're not ownership. They have their own agency. They also act in their own interest, in their own interest, in this case being to try to push professional news, to try to push um, credible journalism, because they thrive on that. Journalists understand that they have got to be credible for them to be able to succeed. So if you want to succeed as a journalist, if you want to do good stories, if you want to go further, so you will push this, um, the, uh, the business of uh, writing and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, informing the public from your own corner, your own interest. In other words, you, you understand that I'm not going to succeed by just succumbing to the pressure commercially, politically, legislatively, and otherwise ownership pressures. So that provides a healthy tension between these forces and the other forces. But then in Zimbabwe, now we're seeing a growing 
overbearance of the forces that are political, that are commercial, that are ownership driven against the editorial. So the editorial is uh, being overwhelmed and that compromises the quality of news. But that is not to say that journalists are not pushing to do professional, ethical, and quality news. They are fighting, which is good. They are not just taking the line down. They have their own agents. And uh, that is what will free editorial policies in Zimbabwe. As long as journalists continue to understand that they do not have to just succumb to these forces, they have to continue fighting. It's, it's contested terrain. Journalists themselves have to fight for their freedom to write. It's contested terrain. The political forces, they are fighting to capture the organization of the journalists. Journalists are fighting for their freedom. Not just freedom from arrest, but freedom to write. Freedom to inform, freedom to distribute information, to gather, process and distribute information. So we're seeing those contestations. And uh, sometimes uh, journalists are winning uh, some battles, but not the war yet. Mm. You, you talk about commercial interest. Right now, the market in Zimbabwe, the economy is thin and the market is suffering. Yeah. How, how has this affected the quality of news that you put out there as journalists? Yeah. Uh, the Zimbabwean economy has been uh, struggling for two decades now. What has happened is that it has decimated uh, the media organization's capacity to sustain themselves. So the advertising market or base is shrunk, which means the advertising uh, revenues in the media organizations have also significantly diminished. Readership has collapsed, particularly in the aftermath of COVID, especially in relation to print. So what that means that there's a small pool of advertisers that are actually spending, they're spending it. Uh, revenues or the, uh, the, 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 the advertising budgets are very tight now. So that gives more power to the few advertisers that are in the market. Uh, and because there is a huge pool of media organizations fighting for the same uh, advertisers, they will begin to detect, say, no, if you're going to write like this against us, we're pulling out. Hmm. But because the media organizations are struggling for survival, they begin to say, ah, okay, so let's sit down and talk. What can we drop? What can we not drop? You have compromised now. You have compromised the total policy because you're no longer going to write what you're going to write at the beginning. You're going to write some puff piece so that you can be able to get the, the, the advertising and the revenues in order to sustain mm. yourself. That is really critically undermining editorial integrity and professionalism. Yeah, without without naming without naming the companies, yes. um, you you have been as an editor, you have been at the corner of uh, commercial interest, and you have pushed back yes. at some point. Yes. What what informed you being able to push back and compromise the earnings uh, that were supposed to come to the newspaper? Yeah, the idea is that when we are editorial journalists, we must always remember that our mandate is not to push the commercial interest. First and foremost, yes, there's business to sustain. Yes, people need to be paid, all those things. But that's not the reason why we're hired. But why are we hired? We are hired to write news, to bring information, quality information. We're hired to do journalism. The marketing department is hired to look for business, advertising, events, and all that kind of thing. It's a, a structured business. But then again, this is where the tensions come in. And uh, we need as a troll to continue pushing back against the commercial forces, the political forces, the ownership forces that seek to compromise editorial in order to make money without offering quality service. Mm. Let me bring it down to the journalist himself. Um, poorly paid and susceptible to corruption. Yes. How deep is that problem? It is deep because Zimbabwe now, the economy is uh, really, I mean, 
you just ran out of adjectives to, to describe it. It's really in shambles. Uh, it's, a, it's an economy that is really on its knees, and this has been happening for decades. And that has worsened um, uh, um, uh, corruption in society, society-wide. People are becoming increasingly corrupt because they are struggling to survive. The economy is not sustaining them properly. And that has not spared the journalism sector. Journalists, similarly, they find themselves in those things and they succumb to um, uh, corruption pressures. And that has been a big problem. That's when we see stories being dropped. We see editorial policies being tweaked, uh, compromised. This time by, by the journalists, not by the owners. The journalists themselves, they sometimes compromise that for very small little gain, nothing much, I mean, small little money for lunch, this and that. There isn't any big money that they are getting. I mean, look around, the journalists still remain as poor as they are. If they were getting a lot of money, they would be looking better off, you know. But they still lead pedestrian lifestyles, primarily because they are not well paid, and that makes them um, uh, succumb to uh, bribery, to uh, inducement, to enticement, all forms of bribery, but all, rather all forms of corruption in different manifestations. Mm. So it's a big problem. But the good thing is that we're talking about it. The good thing is that those caught doing it, usually there's action. And the editors who are part of the problem, they're also coming under pressure. You know, the reason is uh, with the opening up of the media, it also helps to fight corruption this way. If an editor is going to block a story about a particular businessman, corporate company, the story will come out on another platform. So as you open up, it makes it difficult for editors to be rent-seeking through holding, not publishing stories. This is why I was saying the other day on World Press Freedom Day that let's close ranks as journalists if an editor refuses to publish to a story, give it to another journalist. They don't control all the media spaces anymore. Things have changed. We should not allow people who sit on stories because they've been paid there. Let's let them get the money, but they will be exposed because the story will be published. Mm -hmm. So we need to continue fighting and pushing back. Corruption is there, but let's fight, push it back. We don't want it to become uh, entrenched to become commonplace in journalism. Mm -hmm. But what, what are the safeguards, say someone, are there any safeguards, say a journalist has been given a bribe and in that newsroom or in a certain newsroom, are there any safeguards that then ensure that a, a story, a puff piece or a, bo a paid story does not sail through easily? Yeah, uh, ordinarily, the structures of the newsroom are supposed to safeguard. I mean, the story comes with the, the reporter, maybe he's working with another reporter through the structures, the line editor, then it gets to news editor. These structures are supposed to uh, easily uh, have inbuilt checks and balances that no one person can stop. But then again, you see, obviously, wherever corruption is involved, they, they circumvent the structures. A reporter goes to, to get a story, he knows that the editor is corrupt, and then he goes straight to the editor, the editor gets the story, says, no, I'm now handling this. So the news editor doesn't see, the, all these other guys don't see. But it's always better if we use the structures. The structures makes it difficult for one person in the whole hierarchy to stop stories, to kill stories. But the people will always be corrupt and try to circumvent that. What we need, in order to continue pushback. We still need, you know, there are still uh, quite a lot of uh, very ethical journalists. In fact, uh, while least we deal with this problem, let's acknowledge that the majority of journalists are not corrupt. They are journalists who just write stories and go home with the very little money that they have. The majority are not corrupt. Because most cases, in any case, uh, is those in positions of influence that are corrupt. The, your average reporters and other personnel within uh, the newsroom, they don't have even the opportunities to rent sick. Mm. It's the, those in critical positions that do rent sick. So overwhelmingly, generally, journalists are not corrupt. What are corrupt are 
the journalists in certain positions where there is a reporter who is doing certain stories, where there is an editor who is handling certain information, there are certain stories the journalists write and there is no simple room for corruption. Well, what corruption can you rent seek from a press conference, from a parliamentary debate? There isn't much you can rent seek. In the courts we know they try to reform cartels that the story must not come out there, must not come out. But with the digital media now, with social media, it's becoming increasingly difficult. You, you have had your chiefs, I mean, as, as you are steering the news hawks, yeah. and you've been attacked, especially from the president's office. Yeah. Um, how, how does that affect your work uh, in terms of independence? Yeah, well, the pressure uh, is always uh, uh, difficult to handle, but we uh, came here, we're doing this knowing very well that there will be pressure, there will be threats, there will be all sorts of things. So it's things we are really used to. We will continue to focus our eyes on the ball, which is reporting the news that we believe are in the public interest. But at the same time, that pressure, it, we take it to mean that it means you're doing something effective. If you are doing things that don't matter, nobody pays attention. Mm. So we take when the president's office, for instance, you know, uh, the, the presidential spokesman, he likes commenting on our things and uh, saying a lot of negative stuff and so on and so forth. We like it actually, by the way. But are you not, uh, are, like you, are you not threatened? Absolutely not. We're not threatened, you know, I'll give you an example when we were doing the Impala investigation. We had a lot of stuff that we wanted to go with. We were starting picking a direction going, you know, the pressure and a lot of things. And some of the guys that we working with here, I remember the other time uh, uh, Owen saying that uh, he has been told by some sources that uh, police will come and uh, arrest us uh, because we're saying CIOs are involved in this and that. I said, no. You see, the best insurance is being factual, being truthful. We don't have any security. Our only security is uh, being factual and truthful. That's your best guarantee against harassment by the state forces. If you do your job rather factually, truthfully, and conscientiously, you are better off than when you are doing a shoddy job which exposes you to attack. Mm. But do you think um, with these threats, um, young journalists can survive in this environment? They've got to tough it up, they've got to face the environment. This is the environment we are working in. We can't uh, uh, have an ideal one. We have to work in. They must come in knowing that it's a tough environment, but uh, uh, emphasize uh, uh, reporting professionally and ethically. They will go through a lot of difficulties, but they, you will emerge uh, on the good. You will emerge stronger, you will emerge uh, successful as a reporter, as long as you do your job properly. They will be threatened, uh, a lot of these things. We know the environment. But uh, we must learn to say we are working in a rather hard to hit area, a difficult terrain. So we must be prepared to work through that. We are not uh, in an ideal environment, but we must be able to commit and say, as journalists, since there's no money, as we always say, our first duty in the first place is public service. We don't earn a lot of money. When we sit here in New York, so like, if I tell you how much we are paid here, you laugh, right? It's not a lot of money, it's very little money. But we do it because we believe that we have a duty to report in the public interest, to tell the people what is going on around us. In aid of what? In aid of good governance, in aid of accountability, in aid of democracy, in aid of a better society that we must all live in, we must build and live in, in aid of a country that we are proud of to live in because it's being governed properly, it's being run properly. That's the reason why we do it. And most of these values that uh, guide us there are values which are enshrined in the Constitution, whether it's it human rights, whether it's good governance. It's all in the Constitution. So eventually, when you look at it, we are feathering constitutionalism. We are feathering 
respect for the Constitution. Because most of the things we do, they are actually values, principles that are enshrined in the Constitution, which came from the people, which means the people themselves, those are the things they want to see in Zimbabwe happening. That is your accountability and the other things, your transparency. Mm, amazing. But some, some have, have actually argued that, uh, you know, like especially from the government circles, that you are foreign funded, um, there are, you know, donors that are giving you money yeah. to fight the President Emerson Minangagwa regime. How do you plead to those allegations? Well, it's ignorance of how journalism is evolving. Complete ignorance. Journalism now, because of what we're saying, the digital revolution has disrupted the media organizations, the advertising is plunged, leadership is plunged. So there came a new a phenomenon called uh, not-for-profit journalism, especially on the investigative side. In order to save society, in order to save journalism itself, certain organizations that have money the means to do it, they are funding journalism around the world. Around the world, there are so many not-for-profit uh, media organizations. What we do is, we come up with an agenda to say we want to investigate corruption and team up, let's say, with Amabungan in South Africa and, uh, and uh, other journalism centers. Um, these are funded by foundations in America, in the UK, and all over the world. They are also funded by individuals because individuals donate and all that kind of thing. In our case, we teamed up with Amabungan. Uh, and uh, the Botswana guys, the Zambian guys, at the conception stage, in order to come up with a concept. They are already receiving resources uh, to investigate. We say, you guys, I mean, talk to your uh, funders and everything so that we can get uh, some bit of funding. But essentially, in our case, what needs to be understood is that the uh, founding of what we are doing, it was funded locally by some banks. We got money. All these things we bought here. You see all these chairs. They were not bought by a donor. You will not find a donor who said they bought us a chair or whatever. We bought these things by ourselves. We bought the, the, the logistics. The donor money is coming to fund specific investigative projects on corruption, on uh, COVID, on training. But we put the infrastructure. It's our money. It's not donor money. We, it's our money. There's no donor who will stand you there and say we bought those guys these days. Because it's simply not true. We got the money here in, Zim, in Zimbabwe to buy the, the things, put logistics. We're putting a small studio there. That money is it's not a donor money. It's money that we sourced it locally from financial institutions. So we know what we're doing. In other words, we want to... Um, uh, have a firewall between editorial and funding. Funding, be it donor funding, be it commercial funding, be it uh, 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 funding from the banks. Because uh, ours is a hybrid model. So we'll have uh, uh, donor funded investigative projects, we'll have uh, money that came from the banks, we'll have money that comes from commercial activity. That's how the model is structured and that's how we want it to be because we believe that it gives a, us a better chance to have a free editorial policy. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's completely uh, uninformed people who assume, will assume that those guys have bags of donor money there. They are no bags of donor money here. We have had to borrow money locally. Mm -hmm. But in, 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 uh, in maybe as we, as we conclude, uh, this was a May, May 3 Press Freedom Day and uh, the international community, including Zimbabwe, were celebrating. Is there really anything to celebrate for Zimbabwean uh, media space? And going forward, what is it that you would want to see? We're, there is a lot to celebrate. Uh, journalists have succeeded in pressuring government to do certain things they were resisting. Some of them I mentioned them earlier. That's a worth celebrating because that shows the pressure that is being brought to bear on government but the media sector is beginning to bear fruits even if it's going to be incremental progress. There's also a lot to celebrate the courage of journalists. People tend to just think that journalists are just uh, corrupt people who wake up there to look for bribes. Though 
People do a lot of work. They invest a lot of energy to do stories. You do a lot of programs um, that inform the, the, the people, you guys. I don't believe that you are doing them because you are paid. In fact, I know because you'll be pushing your agenda to inform the public on issues of public interest. So most of the work that journalists do, progressive work, that must be celebrated uh, across the board. Across the board. This is regardless of the interference that we were talking about. Owners interfering, politicians interfering, um, companies or the corporates interfering. J journalists are still doing a great, a great deal of a good job in very difficult circumstances. That is worth celebrating. Going forward, we need to push for reforms. Reforms particularly in the area of broadcasting. We need to have uh, licenses that are given to different players. We cannot have an industry in which we just magnify the same voice, which means consolidating a, a one voice or a monopoly by other means. That needs to be, a, a, to, to, to be reformed. In fact, that needs to be completely changed. The other areas of change is criminalization of journalism must stop. Journalism is not a crime. When journalists go and write things that uh, those in power don't like, their abuse of office, abuse of power by arresting journalists, by hounding journalists, the whole Polishing Wano case, the Mdutu Smatuto case, where he was uh, hounded. And then you have a young journalist, uh, Tawanda Mchewa, was abducted and tortured. We condemn those things in the strongest terms possible because that's criminalization of journalism. That shouldn't happen. Journalists are not a threat to government. They are a threat to those who are corrupt. They are a threat to those who abuse office. If they are a threat to those who abuse power. So if government is corrupt, you are corrupt, you are a threat to the government. Yeah, that, that, that we are a threat to, 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 corrupt, to corrupt officials in government. Because not everybody in government is corrupt. Not everybody. There are a lot of hardworking civil servants in government who get nothing. But there, there, there are a few who are corrupt. I say a few because it's those in strategic positions that can be able to manipulate tenders, that can be able to sign off certain amounts of uh, public expenditures. So it's those few that are corrupt but who are powerful who see journalists as a threat. But journalists are not a threat to government. They may be a threat to the corrupt ones, yes, certainly, to corrupt officials right from the top going down. They may be, journalists may be a threat to those ones, but they are not a threat to government, in other words, a threat to the establishment, a threat to the state. They are not. They are a threat to corrupt people. They are a threat to people who abuse office. They are a threat to people who perpetrate human rights abuses. Journalists certainly are a threat because they, they want to shed light on those dark corners and expose them. As they say, democracy dies in darkness. So that's why they feel threatened. But they, they are not threatened to, to overthrow government, to remove government. There's no journalist who is a threat to government. Mm -hmm. But they will then say that uh, they are activists, they are this and that. When you hear people arguing like that, you must know that they have something to hide. If they have nothing to hide, let Hope World you want to write about uh, these COVID things. If there is nothing, it will be sure that no, 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 he has nothing to, to write about. But when you see them agitated, it means they are afraid that if journalists continue on that path, on that line of inquiry, they will discover something that exposes us, that shows us to be people who are stealing from the public, people who are undermining uh, public integrity, who are undermining public systems, who are making people suffer in the end. Um, Mwadaini, before I close, I see you are there. Um, do you want to ask a question or add your opinion on the issues on discussion? Yes, I wanted to find out from from the son. He said that uh, ask him if if we can see that the journalists are free to report on any story here in Zimbabwe. Or do we have to choose? Uh, she, she's asking if journalists in Zimbabwe are free to report on any story, uh, in, on on any story, uh, or they have to choose which stories to cover which individuals to report about. Uh, is, am I correct, Madaine? Yes, yes. Yeah, journalists are, are very free in Zimbabwe to report on any story. But the question is always what happens after the reportage. You can write any story that you want. 
But what happens after writing is the problem. Uh, as long as uh, you are not stopped internally in your um, uh, establishment and so on, you can write any story. But in any case, like I was saying, the media is open. Um, if, if someone blocks a story there, you take it somewhere. So you can write anything, but there is always a reaction. The reaction is the problem. Government usually, when you write stories they don't like, either they demonize you, say issue statements, uh, labeling you this and that, or in some worst case scenarios, they arrest you. Uh, if they know that they've arrested you and they don't have a strong case, what they do, just like all repressive regimes do around the world, uh, act with impunity, they make you suffer a, a lot through pre-trial detention. Because they know when you go to trial, you will, you will be acquitted. So detain the guy for as long as you can before trial so that when he's acquitted, he has already saved his time and suffered enough. Now, I want to thank you very much, Jimmy uh, uh, Leia, for, for your time and for, for, for your words. Um, yeah, in your introduction, I had forgotten to mention that you're also the chairperson of the Zimbabwe Editors Forum, and you're working uh, you know, to ensure that there's a free media space and that the media journalists continue to do what they are supposed to do and improve this country and improve democracy in Zimbabwe. Thank you very much, Jimmy uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, Thanks uh, to your team as well. Yeah. In our second segment, we will be speaking to Madame Susan Makore and we're going to be having insights into that show. I am your host, Dara Blessed Mlang. I thank you very much for joining us on this, uh, the show Free Talk, where we're joined here by Susan Makore, who is also the Zimbabwe Media Commission uh, Commissioner. Um, she's also, she also works in, uh, as a country director for a developing uh, partner for women in news, that is WIN. Now we're going to be discussing with her, uh, her views about uh, the media in Zimbabwe, where it is going and what uh, she thinks could create a better space for the media in Zimbabwe and the extent of media capture. Now, thank you very much, Madam Akore, uh, for joining us. Thank uh, you for inviting me. Beautiful. Yes. You have a vast experience in the media industry. You've worked as a CEO for a major media company uh, and you've worked as a journalist yourself for a very long time. Now, from the vantage point that you sit, what is your prognosis of the media situation in Zimbabwe? I would say developing, right? The media industry is developing, it is growing. Uh, for me, I'm excited about uh, the broadcasting industry, um, where I've been working uh, for the past 12 years. Uh, obviously, the media house I was working in was also into print, uh, but everybody knows that, uh, you know, I cut my teeth in, in broadcasting, and that's the area I'm passionate about. So for me, the development of having new players is exciting. Yes, it's been late in coming, but it is here. And I hope very soon we will start seeing those radio stations, I mean the radio stations in terms of um, uh, the community radio stations that have been granted licenses operating in those communities. That is a major development. And also the television stations, the six I think that were given uh, TV licenses, we expect that we will see more diversity. Diversity not in terms of products but in terms of uh, uh, viewpoints as well. And uh, really just representing uh, various sectors that uh, one player, uh, ZBC, could not be uh, able to, uh, to cover. Mm -hmm. Some have said that we have, uh, we have plurality in Zimbabwe but we do not have diversity in terms of our media. Um, from what you know and what you have seen, would you agree with that statement? When you look at the print, we have both uh, diversity and plurality. Because you see that the, the print media covers uh, issues so differently. So that is, uh, that is fantastic. Uh, when it comes to radio, I think when you look at the way the radio stations were licensed, they were licensed on the basis of being able to provide both the plural element and the diversity element. However, it is unfortunate that some radio stations have not been 
providing the services that they are supposed to be providing. For instance, if you are licensed as a talk station and you gave an, uh, uh, almost like a, uh, a perspective of the type of, uh, uh, you know, topics and areas you cover and you are not doing that, that is where maybe the shortchanging has, has, has come in. But in terms of uh, uh, the broadcasting authority, picking on different kind of uh, areas, they did that. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the issue then would be the monitoring aspect. Maybe they need to do more in terms of monitoring whether that specific uh, radio station that they gave a license to provide a certain service, whether that radio station is doing that. Mm. Some, some have spoken about media capture and saying that mm. there's an overbearing of political, commercial, and even um, your know, political and commercial capture in the media industry. What is your viewpoint on that? I don't know about capture, um, but what I do know is that the media industry in Zimbabwe is a business. Even when you look at uh, the public, or well, some call it state, but I would call it uh, the public broadcasters, they are mainly pursuing uh, commercial interest because their failure to make money means that they are not able to provide the service. So I think... Uh, so they are commercially captured? I wouldn't call it commercially uh, captured, mm -hmm. but really if you are in a business, you are looking for a return in, your, in terms of your investment. So if I am a shareholder uh, and... I want the business to continue as a going concern, that business must be able to make money. And how does it make money? It makes money by going after uh, the areas, the sectors that can advertise. Um, you are aware of uh, what happened last year with COVID, that when we went into lockdown, uh, there was a clear challenge in the sense that the drivers of that economy uh, economy in terms of the advertising sector when they were also locked down in terms of manufacturing there was nothing to advertise they couldn't advertise when they were not in production so it then meant that now for the media houses they now had to go looking for wherever the money was so if the money was going to come from those that were uh, manufacturing PPEs because they were the ones that were in business we started having online lessons so if uh, the entities that had money to advertise were those that were offering uh, data packages and telecoms. So it then means as a business, you go where the money is. Mm. So I don't, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily call that capture, but I would call it survival. How you do then you have buffer? to survive as a business. How do you buffer the interest of surviving and the interest of pr providing a service? Um, that uh, the editorial independence, because Dumisani Mulea, who is uh, the Zimbabwe uh, chairperson of the Zimbabwe Editors mm -hmm. Network, says that there is that commercial capture where advertisers would withdraw their money if they feel that your stories are unnecessarily or unfairly against them or their interests. I, I think maybe it's 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 uh, it's a bit uh, it's not so black and white. Look, I think it's clear that when you are in the business of providing a product, you are targeting a certain audience. If you are a radio station, there are certain expectations that your audiences have in terms of the product they are used to. If you are a radio Zimbabwe, there is a certain product you must provide for you to remain in business. And your remaining in business means you have certain listeners that you are selling to advertisers. So how do we balance so, that? So the issue is really the customer, even in the business of broadcasting, in the business of uh, print media, is king. If you stop pushing a product that attracts listeners, viewers, readers, you are out of business. So I think it's all these things put together. Understanding your mandate as a business to your shareholder, and your shareholder expects you to keep on making money and you keep on making money because you've got listeners you keep on making money because you've got readers so what do the readers want even if you get captured as you put it by one telecoms company tomorrow you wake up with no readers so you have to go back to the readers so i think it's an over exaggeration that uh, 
uh, you get captured by commercial by a single commercial yes you can have interest in making sure that you are commercially viable by ensuring that you reach out to a diverse group of uh, advertisers and that's the best way of doing it you can't rely on one advertiser if that one advertiser goes bust what do you do so you have to appeal to a wider group of advertisers so that you can survive as a business mm -hmm. let's talk about the journalists themselves the economy as you have said has tanked mm -hmm. tanked to some point and employers are not really able to pay journalists that much mm -hmm. and politicians have said Journalists are hired guns. Mm -hmm. They are being paid to do certain things wrongly. Now, you were chief executive of a media organization. Did you come across these things and did, does, did it worry you? Look, I think uh, from way back, uh, there's always been this issue of brown envelopes of people being paid. I think like in any sector, you know, uh, you have bad people, you have good people. You have bad apples. And this will happen. And yes, it is a fact that um, uh, last year, especially, if, if I'm just looking at uh, short term, uh, there were instances where media houses were having to cut uh, on salaries, uh, mainly because um, some of the employees were not working. They had to be at home, not even working. And also because of the issues that I outlined, that once uh, you had uh, the majority of the manufacturing sector going on lockdown, they were not advertising. So where there is no money coming in, it then means as employers, you also have to, one, downsize, two, even reduce uh, uh, the cost in terms of uh, what you're paying staff. But on the issue of corruption, it is a cancer that is in society. It cannot just be attributed to the media sector. I think everywhere across the country, we have seen this happening. We've seen uh, what uh, the Zimbabwe Anti-Corruption Commission has been trying to do across the board. So yes, uh, journalists are people that are living in a society that has uh, corruption, that is corrupt. And as individuals, some of them will get caught up in that. I, I really think it's, a, it's really a broader issue that needs uh, to keep on uh, being talked about. And one would then assume, since the journalists are at the forefront of also talking about how bad corruption has been and how much it has damaged our society, they would also feel a bit of, uh, you know, a, a drawback morally to also not engage in corrupt activities. Mm -hmm. Now, you, just uh, as uh, we wrap up, you also work with the women in news. Mm -hmm. You've been supporting uh, the media uh, in this COVID-19 mm -hmm. uh, pandemic, mm -hmm. how it has affected it. Now, tell us the, some of the work that you are doing to ensure that the media remains afloat. And if you think that without external support, the media in Zimbabwe can survive. Um, when I look at uh, the interventions that uh, the World Association of uh, News Publishers is making, it is really from understanding that without the media players, I mean, I'm working in eight African countries right now in terms of the Women in News project. Yes. Uh, when we started the Women in, in News initiative, uh, when COVID hit, it was to make sure that uh, uh, female journalists were able to continue with their work. They had PPEs and so on. But then we then realized that they are working within a broader uh, work uh, environment. So the coming on board of the support on sustainability and uh, uh, stability of media organizations is to ensure that the media houses remain stable so that the women have places to work. Some were reporting that uh, their salaries were being cut by at least 50 percent. Some were actually being removed from full-time employment and being put on freelance and this is across Africa. So uh, women in news then decided that they would come in and support media houses to apply for grants. So media houses uh, that are partners, like in Zimbabwe we have four uh, partners, uh, which are the big media houses. So they can come in as an organization and apply for a grant to sort of do certain projects that they may not have the resources to, to do because of the challenges that COVID has, has placed them in. And also 
even the individual women can also apply for those grants. So that's how Women in News is coming in to support both the workspace in terms of the media houses being able to apply for these grants and also the individual journalists being able to apply for grants. Mm. They may not be phenomenal amounts, but they are amounts that can actually assist a media house, especially where you are perhaps not having resources to go out and cover marginalized areas. We are actually putting more emphasis on that as women in news to say we will support your project if we see that it is extending beyond. For instance, if you are a media house that is usually just uh, covering news from urban areas, we will support your project to go to Dande or to go to, uh, you know, Binga to cover a story which you would now not be able to do because you don't have the resources. So those are the kind of uh, initiatives that we are actually running with as uh, as one IFRA Women in News project. Mm. And uh, the, the last part of the question, do you think media can survive without such kind of interventions and aid, especially in Zimbabwe, given the economy? I would want to, to say so. Uh, I think once the economy opens up like it is doing now, uh, once business kicks in and the advertising part of it from a, a commercial angle comes in, that is the best model. You would want your media to be supported by the community, by the industries, by the country initiatives in your particular country. Uh, when uh, entities like One Ifra are coming in to support, this should be on a temporary basis because there has been a crisis. But all things being equal, countries should be in a position to support the media because they are part of the the ecosystem they are part of uh, and part and parcel of how we live our lives so obviously the media should derive its livelihood from its own uh, uh, own industries and its own country any parting words uh, you know view to the media in zimbabwe uh, to the to the people who are supposed to trust the media and to mm -hmm. the journalists and the publishers uh, my my parting word would really be that at a time that such as this where sometimes we have to look at the role that media plays in giving information that must ensure people survive. We have to ensure that we supply information that is factual, information that builds, information that pulls people together because when you are looking at a crisis like the one that we we are in because covid is still there we need to ensure that people do get tested people do get access to treatment and people do get access to vaccination yes it's a given that right now we are it is in a, in a situation where even the vaccines themselves are supposed to be to arm us against uh, getting into you know serious waves of um, uh, you know of disease and uh, catastrophe so i think the media has to put it itself in a place of empathizing not just empathizing with the ordinary person empathizing with the establishment that we have with the arms like your minister of health and so on so that the information gets to people Yes, we are in a position where sometimes it is difficult to uh, go out and find out what people are going through, but it is critical for us to, even as a media sector, to look at how we can use technologies to reach further than what we are reaching. If, it, if it's media houses that must set up WhatsApp groups so that people in remote areas get information, let's make sure that we do so. But I think it is critical for the media to play its role in providing information that saves lives. Thank you very much, Madam Susan Makore. Now, uh, thank you very much, viewers, for joining us on this free talk program brought to you in proud partnership with Frederick Newman Foundation. Um, now, we've been talking to uh, Madam Susan Makore and also have had a conversation with uh, Dumisani Muleya on the state of the media in Zimbabwe, state media, the brown envelope, um, and how best the media can save us, you and me. Thank you very much for joining me. Until next time. Goodbye. Frederick Newman Foundation has been a partner in the media industry in Zimbabwe.
has been a partner in my personal media journey. They've supported me and they continue to support numerous media activities, especially during these hard times of COVID where media organizations are failing to wither the storm. Their support has been integral and their support remains integral even in bringing this show, these in-depth conversations that will change Zimbabwe, that will aid democracy in this country. Frederick Newman Foundation, our partners in free speech. Thank you.